Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Around the Coin. We're excited today. We've got a great episode lined up. It's the three of us, Brian, Faisal, myself, Mike here. And CES has been the hot topic as of late. Uh, but before that, Brian, Faisal, how are you guys doing? Good morning on this beautiful Sunday, good Sunday morning. crisp morning in Los Angeles. Good morning. How are you? Good, good. We Brian's missed you, Mike. traveling all around. I know. You guys had a great episode last week. Yeah. We are uh, already seeing the fruits of our labor showing up this week. So, absolutely. How was your journey? You had taken a journey uh, Yeah, uh, Christmas. Eastward. Christmas is nice. Went out to East Coast, New York, D.C., Connecticut. Um, yeah, it was great. Missed you guys, for sure. And... Uh, Missed the uh, been living vicariously through you, Brian. Your CES journey, um, <laughs> Faisal. How are you doing over in Pakistan? Are you now? You've been traveling all around. I'm back at the home base. Yep, mm-hmm. doing good. Had a lot, lots to travel. Settling down for a couple of weeks before I pack my bags again and head out. Oh my God, on the road again. <laughs> yep, <laughs> on the road again. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so, Faisal, have you been up on what's been what's been uh, top of mind for you lately? Uh, just 2017, man. Just figuring it out, planning it out. Have you set goals. any New Year's resolutions? I yeah, see you hitting I, I the gym. Do. I'm impressed by that. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So that's one thing. You know, after a long, long period. But yeah, the New Year's resolution was do more good, read more books, and travel. You can't do more. More is just it's too vague. You need you need like 12, 12 <laughs> additional or, uh, you know, people, I, some people are looking at 52 a year, 52 books, one oh. a week, which is what nuts. I'm beyond that already. I use voice, man. Have the book read to you. Have yeah. the book read to you. Audible. Yeah. Well, what no, no. I, I showed a little uh, secret where you slide your two fingers down your home screen oh, and right. anything on a screen can, uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you don't have to read books. Just read more. It's in the background. And when Brian, I'm not, have you mentioned that on air yet? Yeah, I, I did. We we talked about it last week, Faisal. Right, the uh, little last voice time. trick. Last yeah. time we did. Yeah, yeah. it it it's uh it's really shocked a lot of people. It's been there ever since Siri was around. So, uh, I, I I I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier, but I mean it's been it's revolutionized my life. I mean I can get I can get six books a week in if I want to. I mean, and just to, just to repeat what it is, if you go to if you have an iPhone, you go to accessibility and you turn on uh, what is it called? Voice reading. There's a section uh, there. uh, screen reading. Uh, it's and, and basically it's part of accessibility. But to me, it should be front and center. The fact that it's hidden and not talked about is ridiculous to me. Why would you not want this? Especially with AirPods. I mean, I'm, mm. I got to tell you guys, you put the AirPods in, you go about doing other things. You multitask. You don't have mm. to have 100% of your attention on every book that you read. If it so starts sparking the, the, your mind. Not even books. The beautiful, beautiful thing about this, I found, if you, go to, if you go settings, general, accessibility, speech, and you turn on speak select, that allows you to anything on your phone you can have read to you. So if you're looking at like a medium post or any blog or anything, it'll just read through in, in pretty clear voice. Uh, anything that's going on. So I, I find that huge. I don't know why more people don't talk about that or use that, but that's a great feature. Another another benefit is under the same screen, there are the, the voices you can choose and always download the high quality voice. Most people have the default low quality voice or the Siri voice. Uh, Susan is a really good reader. Uh, Alex is a good reader. Um, it, it's interesting to use different voices for different modalities. I tend to like female voices for a lot of reasons, um, but Alex works uh, for some of my other stuff that I use it for. So I always love the British accent. The, I, I use British on all of my posts. Uh, in fact, uh, all of my posts in 2017 will have a podcast attached to it, which is essentially, um, you know, a British guy speaking what I've written. What? Why do? Why does British? Why do British accents just sound smarter? Is that? Yeah, uh, is that accurate? Do, Faisal, yes. do you have that opinion? <laughs> I, I mean, I went to school there, boarding school, so it's just normal for me. I don't you, you, have a, you have a British accent, uh, Faisal, uh, in my view. Uh, you've always, it's very slow. Sometimes very slight. it comes out. Sometimes it yeah. comes out. But, yeah, but I think your but word think choices are very um, British. I think it's more of more to do with a lot of um, TV in America, right? So if you look at 
all the TV, you'll notice that one person has to have a British accent. It is <laughs> yeah. almost a necessity now. <laughs> and TV shows. <laughs> Yeah, uh, check it out. <laughs> Next time, you'll be so cognizant of it, you know. Um, oh, no. I mean, barring the Cosby show or something, right? Uh, you'll just see that there's always one person with this, you know, manufactured or sometimes genuine British accent. That's funny. I wonder if that's part of like a, is there a thing of, uh, of, of voice diversity now? I don't know. Maybe someone did a research, subliminal advertising or more attention or something. I don't know. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so we saw recently in, in some news here, um, Bitcoin spiked, which was exciting to see. I know, you know, three of us are very bullish on it, and Brian in particular, you have a lot of experience mining and, and mining other coins as well. What, what do you think caused it? Uh, either of you guys have any opinions on yeah. what was the spark there? Yeah, it was the Chinese economy and the Indian economy. Uh, these currencies have been, uh, for whatever reason, uh, the best way I can call it is devalued. And that's a form of inflation, uh, and it effectively deflated their um, currency. So what happens is if you're a saver, you are being marginalized if you keep your capital in you know, revenue uh, systems like a, um, a currency. So what one finds is a flight to a commodity, and Bitcoin is a cross-border commodity that can be uh, an investment vehicle that can be you know, obviously moved around and, and traded. So we saw that spike in China. I think about 80% of uh, most of last week transactions originated from China, and the rest were pretty much in India. Most of the rest Western world are sitting idly wondering why they didn't buy Bitcoin when it was $200 or $300. So I think that's what we're seeing. We're also seeing a reaction to the Chinese government making a comment that, that Bitcoin uh, investments are not guaranteed and you better watch out and it, the price will drop. And surely the price dropped uh, almost $200 or so right after that announcement. But that was also done when Bitcoin was $500 and it dropped. And now we're you know in $800 range, $900 range. It, the bottom line is the directional is going to be Bitcoin 10,000. Uh, I'm not predicting that in you know 2017. Uh, some of my best mathematic friends, people are literally rocket scientists, have absolutely no problem predicting Bitcoin 1 million. And that is an individual wow, coin of $1 really? million. Dollars. What, what, um, what, what do you think the high would be for 2017? Uh, I think we're go probably going to be about fifteen hundred dollars, but we may go up as high as three thousand if if some world events take place. But um, the directional is going to be higher. It's and, and the only caveat is what I've been experiencing. I've been working a lot with quantum computing. I've been very, very, very fortunate to, to be at uh, a university in Southern California that has one of the few quantum computers. Uh, and I'm, I'm running a few algorithms with permission. Uh, they only wow. run a very small period of time. And my, my, my concern is what will happen with any form of encryption is quantum computing will invalidate that encryption. And that could and very well mean that Bitcoin encryption, uh, if you want to call it that, could be broken. And if it's broken by quantum computing, then the validity of that currency or its monetary uh, value could uh, could very well fall apart. It won't just be currency. I mean, it'll be everything. SSL certificates, PGP encryption, communications, oh, yeah. everything, right? Yes, we can assume that in our lifetime, there will be no secrets. And that will be because of quantum computing. Uh, and I, I'm not being facetious. The The... Reality is when you understand the physics of entanglement and superposition and you finally, and I think the average person will finally get their mind wrapped around this in our generation, uh, in this epoch, will recognize the fact that what we thought we knew about reality is going to change dramatically. The fact that a quantum computer operates, it means that what Einstein said was spooky action at a distance. That means two particles that have in some way entangled can interact with each other at sometimes supremely uh, far distances, instantaneously, superseding what appears to be the travel of light. 
uh, the speed of light, we are looking at what is going to be a different common acceptance of what reality is. The quantum computer generates a form of entanglement within a supercooled environment that allows superposition uh, to take place, where, in fact, almost every possible universe, and that's how you know quantum physics, at least the accepted view, I have other views of this, but the accepted view is that every possible universe that can exist is existing all at once, and the observer uh, makes these superpositions happen, and the entanglement carries them across universes in a sense. So that means a universe where you were able to figure out somebody's 79-digit password exists someplace, and the quantum computer accesses that. That's the best way I can explain it in layman's term. And this happens almost instantaneously. Uh, the, the barrier to the quantum computer today is being a few degrees above Kelvin, which is actually colder than deep space. But the problem is solvable as the space that you need to occupy that very cold temperature uh, gradient is made smaller. And when it becomes the size of a pinhead, right, where you only have to make that space, you know, a few degrees above Kelvin in the size of a pinhead, it means it's much easier to do. And then instead of having just one uh, qubit or 10 qubits, qubits are these areas that we've super cooled, currently about you know, half a foot long. That's a lot of work to keep a half a foot long area cool to a few degrees uh, above Kelvin. In fact, the supercomputer literally sounds like a human being. It, it breathes. It, 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 it has a heartbeat. Uh, it, it, it has all sorts of um, uh, human kind of interactions when you're dealing with it. It's kind of funny. But when, when we super shrink this, we're, we're, at the, um, we're not even at the tube level in quantum computing. We're at the mechanical sort of gearing level. And when we get down to the transistor and the integrated circuit level, the quantum computer, that's when it gets interesting. So anyway, I wanted to drop that in because it's been something I've been working around for a while. I finally, over the last uh, couple of weeks, have gotten some interactions in reality. I've simulated a lot of my uh, programs in this. Um, what it really means to all of us is that Pretty much instant knowledge is going to be made available, but also instant solutioning of very, very complex problems. Things that we thought would take, you know, thousands of years of Moore's Law to get to. Where, where we think today that if we throw more transistors at the problem and more heat, right, because transistors mean more heat, that somehow we'll solve it. Quantum computing is moving past that and saying, no, no, no. We're actually don't needing, we don't really need more transistors. We need to access superposition more. So that's quantum computing. Uh, I probably so, should have mentioned that more uh, in the show uh, last time. Okay, okay. Moving on to CES, which was the consumer electronic show that happened in Las Vegas. Uh, rumor has it you were there. Rumor is correct. I... Um, like a lot of... And, what, and, and, and if rumor is correct, can you tell us... What rumors did you see you witness? Well, let's let's confirm rumors. I was available at CES. I was absconded at uh, at a warehouse at the end of the desert, and I showed off what I call proactivity, prolax, and um, uh, let's call it um, uh, let's just say proactivity is uh, and prolax. the the uh, The voice stuff that I'm working on right now is about three generations ahead of what we're seeing with Siri, Alexa, Cortana, even Viv. This idea that um, it's Q&A, uh, where you're asking questions and giving answers. Uh, some, of my, um, mm -hmm. some of my contacts over the year, actually some made last year at CES, wanted to see what I'm working on now. And again, I'm just one guy with really god-awfully ugly code uh, mm -hmm. You know, so, just, <laughs> they're not yeah, there for you, Brian. It's Are fair they? to say that everything or majority of the themes were based around voice, which is yeah. what you Yeah, well, let, let, let me get to why I was there. I showed off what I was doing with proactivity and continuity and prolix. Prolix is this concept where once you start talking to somebody 
after a while, you you shorthand the conversation. You don't create very long verbose. I I sometimes do anyway. Very long verbose reactions. You kind of shorthand it, and over time, it adjusts to you. Uh, my voice interactions, uh, the software that I'm creating, it does that automatically as it gets to know you. So it doesn't react every time the same way it reacts over time in a shortened way that you're more comfortable with proactivity means that it's talking to you before you ask it a question and continuity means that it remembers what you said in a sentence just before but not only that what you said in a sentence a few weeks ago just like a human being oh i remember the conversation just like us we pick up conversations even our listeners, we pick up conversations and narratives and dialogues that have taken place a year ago. Uh, you don't have that with Alexa. And my memory is just well, not that good, Brian. We'll try to get better. So, anyway, I demonstrated <laughs> that. And then I was very, very fortunate to see what is on on the future roles uh, of some of these uh, companies that have displayed at CES. I've been very fortunate because of my early. Um, early warning system for these folks to mm -hmm. um, to be gaining access to some of their early works and to offer let me some ask of you my let feedback. me ask you three questions three sure. questions number one did you see any payments related voice technology that's yes. my first question okay so tell me uh, payments related voice technology not on the floor uh, right now everybody this assumes it's done Alexa one it's going to be Amazon okay everybody go home and cry uh, what I've been trying to say for the last five years, and not a single, listen to my voice, not a single payment company on the planet understands this, that payment companies are going to be leading the voice-first revolution. And the fact Probably. that you don't see... Well, not if, a, not, not if not born, definitely the, uh, the payment industry, right? Yeah, the reason why... Well, no, the payment... Well, ultimately, that's a payment, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, it all comes down to money. We're replacing advertising as a negotiable unit that was the, the internet, what, that was the web. And fundamentally, we're changing it with commerce. And commerce is tied to payments. And the fact that payment companies are sitting on their hands, stroking their beards, and looking at it, and running around asking anybody with an AI degree to help them to figure this stuff out, wondering why they're not getting it, wondering why they didn't understand what was going to happen at CES – is not surprising that they're in a predicament that they are. And I say this somewhat harshly because I've talked to these folks and they still think I'm an alien, even after what happened at CES. They still- Wait, Brian, let me, let, me, let me ask you a question though. What is the biggest, uh, is the opportunity obvious for payment companies at this point better be. with respect to voice? Or do you look at voice as the, is, is voice the infrastructure so, they can so build maybe, on top of? You know, are they going an Amazon maybe I'll, skill set? Maybe I'll add to Mike. I mean, you know, gaming is one of the first industries to pick up the top end technology. Did you see gaming pick up on voice? Um, yes and no. Uh, you have a lot of the smaller, smaller booths, if you can call it that, tables. Uh, mm -hmm. There were some people that are focusing on Alexa skill sets, uh, Google uh, and Watson inter interactions and others. And what they're trying to do is try to figure out what the killer uh, gaming environment is going to be with this. And what I think they're doing is they're going about it maybe a little too bluntly. Maybe the fact that gaming is going to look profoundly different under these systems is because it's not a visual sort of medium initially, but it will be. And the fact that it's hard for people to understand how the visual aspect, the augmentation of the voice and the augmentation of the reality via visuals, how that's all going to interplay. And my, I've never said it's voice only. I've always said it's going to be voice first. And that's, voice you, know, you could say it's activation. I mean, look at look at first shooter games, right? So if you have you know those sniper games and so forth, so if someone yells or someone says something, taking that interaction or vocal interaction, putting it into the game, so you know which sound, you know from which direction the voice is coming from, etc. That'd be pretty cool. Absolutely. I mean, and 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 there's a lot of that starting. But to to put an end cap on the payments thing, the the reason why payment companies are in a unique position for leadership here is because they have relationships with companies that already have a commerce platform, right? And the fact that 
payment companies see themselves as just sitting at the bottom of the funnel and oh well you know you know ultimately they're going to use our apis because we're at the bottom of the funnel all we need to do is be ready for that that's utterly ridiculous that's like candle makers saying ultimately when the electric light bulb comes around somebody's going to need wax to try to make those lights work they're they're, they're profoundly misunderstanding the shift that's taking place <laughs> yeah, it's I a mean, great analogy. listen, animal husbandry, right? Everybody thought when the car came around, they called it a horseless carriage. They called it a flameless candle. And that's what's going on with payment companies. They're thinking that this is a webless uh, web transaction, you know, and it's not. It's not. And, and, and I can even extrapolate that one level higher. They think that voice is a touchless computer and it's not. Voice is the device, it's the UI, and it's the UX. And it's all of these things compressed into one. And we use our old analogies, you know, the, the, the mechanical pounding of keys or the swiping of, of screens because it gives us comfort. The candle gave us comfort. Of course it did. It became our friend. It, it, it gave light and illumination in the dark. Brian. Let me let me ask you. That's a great point. I I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, with respect to what I think most people interact with technology, at least in the work world, which would be in front of a computer. You're sitting typical experience. You're sitting down in front of a desk. You might have your phone in your hand, but generally your work is done in, your, in front of your computer. There's next to no, as far as I'm aware, input generally into the computer as far as voice. I can't say, you know, laptop. Open up a new Chrome tab and go to Google.com. Uh, but I, I would have to imagine that that has to be on the forefront of, of at least Apple's MO. Apple hasn't made a play in uh, at-home voice. You know, there's no equivalent of Google Home or Echo for Apple. Do you think their MO and their 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 focus is going to be spent on building out Siri for laptop and for your phone to interact with your computer in a in a more voice Mike, that's a really way? great question and a great observation. Uh, let's take a step back. What we learned at CES is, number one, I'm not crazy. No, I'm not crazy. Everything I said, I just didn't give it enough justice for the last five years. It all happened in essentially one day, literally overnight. We are talking about some of the largest manufacturers leading with voice. LG has a, uh, has a refrigerator that will absolutely blow your mind. And it is finally a refrigerator with technology that you want to own because you can talk to the refrigerator. It knows what's in there. It can assemble that food that's in there into delicious recipes. And yes, it has a screen. Like I said, it's voice first, not voice only. So LG saw that. Samsung saw it. There's a vacuum cleaner. There's a trash can that's voice interacted. There are Ford Motor Company is creating cars and interfaces where you could sit in your living room and say, Ford, start my car, you know, and and uh, set it to 71 mm, degrees cool. uh, temperature and uh, route it so that I can get to the beach and give me some suggestions on where I want to go to along the way. And while I'm there, order me up some coffee and pay for it using my debit card. See, what we're not understanding is the mechanics, I'll give you an example. Controlling the computer with our voice in a similar manner, like opening up windows and closing windows, is like getting a machine to flick a match to light a candle when you have a light bulb right next to you. <laughs> so what, what we find with electricity, see, voice revolutionized the concept of electricity. Uh, sorry, the electric light revolutionize the concept of electricity. If, if, if we didn't have the light bulb, we wouldn't have thought about use of electricity. Oh, perhaps there's about 70 electric motors in most people's homes. That's the hidden element of electricity. But the light bulb is a thing that popularized it in the forefront of somebody's mind. Um, there would not be any superhighways if there wasn't automobiles. But let's look at electricity. Electricity revolutionized a new concept of how we see our world. Voice first is a similar type of thing. We, we think of it as an appendage onto the computer, and it's hard for us to divorce it from that because we keep on wanting to go back to the old modalities of trying to light the candle using an electric motor to flick a match. We have to kind of move forward and say, what was it that we were trying to accomplish on the computer? What was that thing, that, that little routine that we go through when we sit in front of the computer? That kind of looks like grandpa with his 
you know, his, uh, his, you know, when Grandpa goes in, in these movies and he sits in his little easy chair and he's got his pipe and his uh, grandpa sweater on and his little slippers and he's reading the paper and it looks quaint. And we're like, gosh, that looks all so comfortable and quaint. That's the same routines that we're going to be dealing with with us old folks that are 25 years old right now. The 25-year-old old folks <laughs> yeah. are saying, oh, my God, yeah. you know, I sit down with my device, I get relaxed, and I interact. The real young folks, the ones that are 8, 9, 10 years old, they're saying bullshit to that. They're saying, you know, I don't need all of those routines that you've established in your life to drink your morning coffee. What I need is to get on to doing other things. And what's going to be replacing that is what we've just started to see at CES. I mean, we have the leading... The, all right, CES is essentially run by uh, a, a consumer uh, technology association, and the leading futurists and technologists of this company that puts on CES pronounced it. He said, this is it. This is the change. This is the biggest thing that everybody was looking for. The CES will be remembered in history as being the voice first, CES. And what that means is that it just didn't, it, it wasn't a device it was it a, a patina painted on top of everything that's there. Of course, it starts that way. It's an entire shift. It's a revolution. When you look up the term revolution, it's this flooding that changes out the old way of thinking and the old guard. And it's rising up faster than the cutting edge technologists can deal with. The very same paradigm that they threw on all of us. You're just not fast enough as us. Middle America, your manufacturing jobs are gone and us technology, they themselves are now being run over by their own technology. And what I'm basically saying is we're going to be, we're going to all be programmers. We're going to be programming our devices the very same way we, we teach our children. We teach our children by example and they grow with us and our investment in our children are the greatest, I hope, I hope is our greatest investment we'll ever make in our life. And the second greatest investment we're ever going to make in our life by the time 2030 is arrived would have been in our voice first, uh, let's call it our intelligent assistance. And, and that investment is yeah. not somebody typing on a keypad in, a, in an abstract language. That's going to be you educating it. And when the world starts doing that on a massive scale, the idea that anybody's job is safe is ridiculous. So anybody who's, anybody who's smugly sitting there in this economic environment and saying, ha I'm, ha, I'm safe, I'm a technologist, you aren't. I'm a technologist and I'm saying my job, my life is not safe from this. And that's not to give fear. What? One, uh, one interesting note, too, is I think a lot of people think about Echo as being, or Alexa, I think they're almost synonymous at this Band-Aid. point. Band-Aid. But in Band-Aid the home, Xerox, primarily. Sorry. Yeah. It, we're, we're, most people think about that technology being available in the home. It's something I use to, you know, uh, turn the lights off, turn the lights on, do my smart home activities. Uh, but once I leave, that that's sort of it. And the, the one takeaway I had from CES was this is being integrated across the board, everything from... Ford becomes the first automaker to bring Amazon Echo into their cars. So the, the, the beautiful thing is that now Amazon, through Alexa and Echo, have so much more data that they can collect across so many different parts of your life. So when you're driving and you're in the car, they can learn what kind of music you like to, to drive to or work out to. Or they can you know connect to a Fitbit and they know you're... You know, what if you could have your biological response to certain songs or certain facial, responses, facial right? They, they take your heart rate and that connects yeah. to, to Fitbit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, facial recognition. I mean, it, it gets really interesting. And, and the interesting part is that we're not far away from that being a real response. You know, even when I ask a question to my Echo, which sits, sits in my kitchen, some answers are just, <laughs> they're just awful. Yeah. Right. They're just he just doesn't you know, it's like talking to a like a like a prenatal uh, infant. And, you know, sorry, I don't compute. You know, I'm asking some basic thing like, yeah. you know, where how many grizzly bears are in the world or something. And, and you know, and I think he, she doesn't have the ability to see my uh, discomfort, for lack of and a better word. And she can't learn. She can't learn. There's no, pro- there's no proactivity and there's no but, continuity and there's no self-learning. And that's what's coming. And that's see. 
It, it, two weeks mm-hmm. ago, if I would have said what I just said about CES, you would have thought I was insane. That's not going to happen. This isn't moving. Everybody, everybody I come across, even the quote unquote experts, Brian, you're way ahead of this stuff. It's, you're crazy about it. It's not going to happen that quick. Don't move my cheese. Don't take my candles. Don't take my horseless carriage. I like shoveling crap out of the street. <laughs> you know, the fact is we employed hundreds and thousands of people to shovel crap out of the streets because of horses. You think about the economies. Now, I use this example is because when we're typing on a computer and we're searching, and that's our modality. That's the way we think we need to get at something. We got to have it delivered to us. We have to sift it. That's us shoveling the crap out of the street. What's going to happen is as we teach these devices, they're going to know more about what we like. And Mike, you're absolutely on target. The voice operating system as it stands today is Alexa. And what, what everybody didn't see in 2015, and they were starting to think it might have happened in 2016, was that Alexa is an OS. It's a voice OS and it is pervasive. And why wouldn't you as a manufacturer use this free operating system? It's like Android was, right? You want you might as well slap it on your device. It's free, it's cheap, it's easy. And you got somebody up in uh, Amazon with a Jeff Bezos laugh, if you've ever seen his laugh. Imagine that every time you see another device with Alexa on it because that's the beauty of it. Now. Now it might make sense why I, listen, it doesn't help my potential career choices to make fun of Google, all right? I sat alone, alone at the beginning part of this year, making fun of Google, not naming the Google platform, their voice platform. They call it OK Google. Now, ask yourself this question. If you were LG, Samsung, or Ford, would you say, yeah, I'm going to integrate Google into my platform. And you know what word I'm going to use to start it with? I'm going to start it with OK Google. You're Ford and you're going to allow OK Google to be the wake word inside your car? I think not. They anthropomorphized the name and Alexa became Yeah, that's a no, I, I agree with you. It, it does it does it does make a big difference. Something that they could certainly change, but it appears well, that that's their first well, stake straight out of the it, gate. It hey, injured, Faisal, them. It injured them you're, greatly because they lost this CES hmm. because of it. I gotta be honest. They lost it. Yeah, yeah. Well they, they also have a much more built out uh Amazon no, does. No, that's platform, not the case. It? Nobody does. They 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 are they have just been the first mover and they happen to be really good. I'm not putting down Alexa sure. and Amazon and Echo. They're brilliant. There's almost a two thousand person army working on this. Now you know now you know wow. Yeah, I, well, I think Amazon technically is certainly certainly far more advanced than than, than Google is at this point. You know, they're <laughs> I wouldn't underestimate Google. Faisal, what's your what's your take on the the everyday person using uh, voice technology at this point in your in your part of the world? I'm curious. Is it a <laughs> yeah, is it I, something I we're in a little it bubble? Because, you know, it's not there right maid, there. maids and servants and you know human labor is so cheap. Uh, you can get a very intelligent piece for a price that is way below Alexa. You know what cost in this region. So, uh, <laughs> but no, I'm just being sarcastic. But but. Uh, um, Really, you know, I, I we discussed this last time. I don't see a use until it can start doing things that I'm already doing on my computer. Contextually exactly. understand, you know, stuff that I'm already doing. If it can help do that, you know, that's a, that's a good start for me. I don't know if my kids will do it any differently. But for me, you know, like I said, uh, you know, Alexa, make me an appointment with Brian on Monday the next the next monday uh, at 3 p.m you know uh, pakistan time there's no way like second interact with brian's client or calendar that's a huge problem so even if even if it is available i could construct one but then i'd be sorting that mess out you know oh brian already has a conflict so etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I that's i i like to see alexa devices interacting with each other understanding negotiating and trying to solve a problem a problem as simple as setting a calendar meet you know I, I think that's a really powerful use case. And again, it's voice mediated. I mean, the, the fact that we can't look at how bad it is right now. The fact that we can't mediate calendars by our voice in 2017 is sort of ridiculous. The fact that I can't say, um, 
you know, hey, Siri, set up a, a meeting with, um, with Faisal. Uh, make sure it matches his schedule and my schedule. The fact that and we I can't might do not that. have a Siri, right? So I might have That's an Alexa. Right. We are at we are at where at that point where AOL, CompuServe, and uh, everybody else had their own little email accounts. Email, right? right? There right? you go. So we need, with the simple mail transfer protocol, the simple voice transport protocol. I love it, Faisal. Right? Let me tell you, in 2017, we're going to see that happening because. Most of 2016, I've been meeting in open office hours with folks that are thinking just like you on this. And they sat down and they said, what would it look like as we cross platform? Why would we cross platform? And, and what are the new modalities? And let me tell you guys, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal once this power happens. Once what Faisal has been saying, once you can start being able to mediate across platforms and you can share intelligence across Watson. Uh, I mean, even standalone. Even standalone. I'll give you an example. Uh, the other day, my wife tells me, she says, Do you know how they pronounce Cuba in Cuba? I said, Yeah, <laughs> I know. She says, How? I said, Cuba. So she says, You know what? I've been trying to ask this of Siri all day long, and there's nothing that she could come up with. I said, Do you know how they pronounce Mexico in Mexico? Uh, she says, No. I said, Mexico. You know? They, they, they say that literally. They don't say Mexico, they say Mexico. So what, 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 what's the underlying... Uh, so the underlying thing is, you know, Siri and Alexa, etc. cannot even do such basic tasks, let alone trying to do tasks of trying to interact with other devices and other machines. There is just so much gap that is there, even in the existing device itself. So if you want a, a, an intelligent pronunciation of a slightly different language or would know how to get it done... Alexa can't do it. Neither can Siri for you. You know, you'd have to resort to go to YouTube and hopefully find a video that someone has spent time in making it. Mm -hmm. So there, there are nuances. I mean, it's I, I, granted, it's not a big thing. I don't know how many people want to find out how do you pronounce Cuba in the Cuban accent, right? But but there are there are gaps, and I think these gaps will have to be fulfilled completely before we go to the next level. Yeah, that's a good point, Faisal. And I, I want to bring up another point here is I think it, we've seen Pebble yeah. go out of business uh, last week, two weeks ago. And, you know, I, I think in one sense, our optimistic selves want to believe that this technology so, is so just explain, explain, uh, explain a, 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 a fully abundant. Pebble is. Sure, sure. So Pebble is a device company that makes wearables. Uh, specifically, their big products would be the watches. Um, that they make so similar to their big competitors were Fitbit and, and they you know, were Apple one of the Watch first really. Ones to come out. <clears throat> yeah, they they raised the majority of their money on Kickstarter. Uh, they did tremendously well raising on Kickstarter. I think the they most they raised you know, tens of millions of program, I believe. Yeah, yeah, ever. Um, I mean, they delivered. They were they were a great company. In the postmortem write-up by, we can include it in the show notes. I forget the the, the writer who who put it up there, but he basically said, you know, I think Pebble came at it from an angle of 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 knowledge base first, as opposed to saying, you know, similar to how Apple comes at the the, the market, which is saying this is a luxury item that we want you to wear throughout your everyday living, sort of a lifestyle brand or a lifestyle wearable. And I think where, you know, if you look at the three players, where I think Fitbit excelled was they doubled down on fitness. You know, you wear this when you work out. And we try to get you to work out more because of this. And we track your steps and we track your heart rate. And the Fitbit in itself, the word, you know, fitness is, is a core part of their DNA. And that's where the market has responded with the biggest appetite, saying, you know, we want something similar to what Garmin produces. We want something that helps us track our exercise better, not just something we can wear around, you know, casually. There's just not a big enough need. And so Pebble made a transition to build wearable technology, the watches for the fitness activity user a bit too late. And they said if they had done that earlier, it could have been a different game. But I think even Apple is they struggling are. largely they with are. their Apple Watch. You know, their price point is, is two, three times more what Fitbit is. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Apple buys Fitbit or makes some desperate attempt to uh, retransition their product in a more fitness first way for a much lower price point. Otherwise, I just don't see the market there. I mean, people just aren't, aren't like, buying you know, these things. Apple Watch, I said this the day 
I saw the first patent, uh, and this was you know about nine years ago. The basic first patents that Apple had on watches. I said the watch needs to be at ninety nine dollars psychologically, and this is the same reason why the computer didn't matter at five thousand dollars or eight thousand dollars. People spent that much on personal personal computers at one time. Uh, some of the very first IBM PCs were in the five to six thousand dollar range. Uh, the, the the Macintosh Lisa was ten thousand dollars. The first Mac really wound up weighing in at five thousand dollars. We forget how much of an investment folks made, and that was in 1970, 1980 dollars. Uh, that is like a twenty thousand dollar investment today. So the fact that the yeah. matter is, the personal computer didn't really start making sense until the Commodore VIC twenty. And the uh, and, and this, the the Sinclair the Sinclair got me going. I got a ninety nine dollars Sinclair kit and I soldered it together because I couldn't afford all those other things as a preteen. My parents wouldn't would yeah. pay for it. I mean, it. you have to you have to break through this sort of initial friction of products introduced in the market. I mean, the the I think Jim Collins from Good to Great or Crossing the Chasm was the book that really. Uh, promoted this idea of you have your early adopters that'll buy anything, but then you really have to satisfy the needs of the larger market. And I think it's an important note to just sort of reflect and say, you know, large companies, even Amazon, put out their phone, which was, you know, a tremendous flop. Uh, I don't even think they produce the, the the mobile phone anymore. And so even even large companies have this sort of um, over optimistic tendency to introduce products in the market and then you know see them not work. So it wouldn't surprise me if Apple pulls back from their watch entirely um, or. Or reintroduces something. I think they need to new. lower the price point. I think they need to make it voice first. Uh, I believe that AirPods will prove my point that Apple actually is playing a much longer game. I'm not, you know, counting them out. I think, you know, if I was inside of Apple doing things, I would have done things a little bit differently. Let's be frank about it. We talked about it pre-show. I think you folks would do, do some things differently. I'm not questioning the leadership. I'm questioning the commitment to the future. Uh, and shaping that future, being the leader of that future. But taking a step back, at a $99 price point with, uh, let's say, $99 AirPods and uh, iPhone, whatever they are, initially they're tethered devices, of course, because of the fact of Moore's Law and miniaturization. But at some point, you're not going to care about the phone as much as if you have a good watch with a reasonable screen and good voice-first interaction through AirPods. And the device becomes less relevant. If Apple does not seize this moment of, of owning the near field, Amazon owning the far field, the room-based uh, uh, voice-first world, Amazon will creep into the near field. So there are about 37 modalities. I will only talk about the polarization of two, near field and far field. Apple is still owning the near field as we stand today. Uh, at the end of 2018, it's going to be a much different story if Apple does not revolutionize the near field. And um, we, if you saw my first story I wrote on AirPods 12 minutes after they were released, because I wrote it almost six months earlier, uh, <laughs> it was a little slow was sitting out there uh, cut and pasting. But <laughs> what I said was this is a voice first device. And again, uh, at that point in, in, in the summer, it was a lot of people like, what are enough with the voice first, Brian? You're freaking crazy. Let's put a fire hose on this guy. Um, you know, that's what it will be seen as. It's not a music device. It's, it's a device that allows you to interact with your other devices today. But there's a full W1 processor in there that can do a hell of a lot of stuff. It might be in your sunglasses vis-a-vis -vis snap. It might be inside your arm uh, or on your arm vis-a-vis uh, -vis a watch. But um, let's take yeah. a deeper f picture here, though. Uh, let's... Yeah. Well, let me before let me make one point and then say that I, I think the the message to carry here for for people listening is I do believe very strongly that companies of Apple and and Amazon and and Google's size really are just guys girls sitting inside of a room with more information than you have you know they have some reports and they have studies 
uh, but they're just making decisions on the way that they see the world. I think that there, there's no magic. We assume that because they're you know three hundred billion dollar companies that they are you know enabled with some deeper crystal ball tools and access. And I can tell you they are just you know making bets in the world the same we are. And Snapchat's bets with you know the the bets that they make and Facebook's with the bets that they make. They're just they're just people who you know sleep seven hours a day and they they work you know as much as we work and. Uh, I, I think there's no, there's just as much risk for those large companies at misstepping uh, and misbetting than there are for small companies, which is an optimistic way to look at uh, the potential for you as a small company, a small startup, to make an impact and build something like what Fitbit did. I mean, their story is incredibly inspiring, um, and you can go out there and really compete with with big projects and big Absolutely. ideas. Absolutely, uh, you know, let's let's look at the other backdrop of uh, 2016. Uh, Sears is uh, just about ready to go out of business. Macy's is uh, on their way of going out of business. They've closed uh, hundreds of, well, essentially will want, wind up being hundreds of stores when they're done with 2017. We have to take a step back and wonder, in the same backdrop, Amazon is opening up stores in a physical retail. And I, I, I certainly don't think Apple is going to be shutting down Apple stores. It'll start expanding them also. Uh, I believe what we're seeing is a reinvention of a lot of things. And this comes down to Fitbit, it comes down to Pebble, it comes down to all of these other companies that uh, have seen these watches as activity monitoring devices and not truly what they should be. And they are AI interaction devices and you know activity monitoring and, and the quantitative self is just one aspect of it. Uh, being overly specialized is generally on the long arc of things, uh, becomes a problem. And I think this also is playing out in retail. Uh, Amazon is going to be making a f what I call the flex store. Uh, look over here, it's a bookstore. Look over there, it's a grocery store. Look over there, it's a hardware store. Look over there, it's a, a restaurant. Look over there, it's a food uh, convenience store. You know, what'll start happening is we're going to be morphing what we think is retail. We're going to be morphing what we think is computer devices all of this is going to take place in a very untidy sort of fashion. And those things are all happening at the same time. Meanwhile, real human beings are being impacted by this, obviously. Um, you know, people are going to be losing their jobs. They're going to be thinking that, you know, we're just going to turn into a service economy and that's it. It's all over. This is ridiculousness. It's absolute hogwash. Uh, these folks just tell you that everything's going to be service absolutely have no perspective on the grand arc of history. It's not what happens. And it's not what happens with automation. Automation actually creates new opportunities and new jobs, but they're not the type of jobs that a lot of futurists think that they're going to be. Knowledge jobs where people are sitting in front of devices. If in fact, even one iota of my premise, of my postulation here is correct, those technology knowledge jobs, so that being of a programmer is gonna be just as threatened as any other job. What I am saying is there is not going to be a lack of the need of people. It's going to be how to repurpose those people fast enough to be in front of this wave or to ride the wave and not to wash out in the wave. And that's what 2017 yeah, is going to be about. And it's, it's sad to see some of these companies leave us because they had brilliant ideas. Absolutely brilliant yeah. ideas. No, I agree. Well, guys, it's been a great episode. I look forward to the next one. And thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank, you. thank you to our listeners. Take care. Speak next week. Bye. All right, bye-bye.